Hello, everybody. Today, I want to talk about Louisville's theorem. So this is a bit of a sequel to the last video, which was about the Lie derivative. And at the end of the last video, we derived that the Lie derivative of the symplectic form under a Hamiltonian vector field was equal to zero, which we interpreted as the phase space being preserved by the Hamiltonian flow. And the interesting thing is that this can actually give a very famous result in classical mechanics as a nearly direct corollary. So let's get into it. We have this fact that for any Hamiltonian vector field, the Lie derivative of the symplectic form is zero. Who cares? Well, let's do an example. So let's look at this in 2D. Right. So we have two coordinates. We have a Q coordinate and a P coordinate. And what we are saying is that over any region C, if we add vector region by xh, so, the, so then we get the oh, we get the flow of the region. Then if we integrate omega over this and this, it's going to be equal. Ct. Okay. But remember what omega is in this 2D case. It's just dp, it's just dq, wedge dp. And then the integral over c omega equals the integral over c of dq wedge dp. And if we express that out of differential forms notation, it's p comma q element of c, element of this region of just dq dp. And that's just the area. Right? So this symplectic form, the integral of it, measures the area of a region. So in other words, in 2D, this means area is preserved. This is called Louisville's theorem. says the area in phase space is preserved. Now we can see this a different way in 2D, just to give some more intuition for why this is. We can see this directly from how we define Hamiltonian vector fields. Because remember, if this is like the level set of our Hamiltonian, then we have, we have um, xh, you know, we designed it so that xh was going to be perpendicular to the gradient of h. Right? So then the divergence, so the, the area change from xh locally, that's just the divergence of xh, but you're looking at the divergence of something which is rotated 90 degrees at each point. So that's just the curl. And you can do this out in coordinates if you want, but we get the curl of the gradient of h. And by vector calc identities, that's just zero. Or if you don't want to use vector calc identities, we can use differential forms. Right? The exterior derivative takes h to a one form, that's the gradient one form, and then we take the curl of that as taking the other exterior derivative. But so we can directly see that, you know, this statement of area is preserved is backed up from our notion of a Hamiltonian vector field. Okay, how does Louisville's theorem generalize? on manifolds. Essentially, it's the statement that there is, well, first off, we need a notion of area. So we need like a volume. And we're going to use, remember, so a volume is basically, if we have our phase space B and we consider some sub manifold, some sub volume V and it's sitting inside P, where p is dimension 2n, and v is also dimension 2n. We want to measure the volume of v. That's something that we integrate over, right? We integrate some sort of thing over v. So volume 
v is the integral over v of something. What do we put here? Well, we have to put, I don't know, a 2n form, right? Because that's the dimension of the thing we're integrating over. So this is called a volume form. So something is a volume form if it's a 2n form, or 2n is the dimension of the manifold. It's a, it's a differential form of maximal dimension such that it's never vanishing. It's never zero at any given point. Right, so by integrating with respect to this, we can find a volume of submanifolds. So Louisville's theorem says that there exists a volume form which is invariant under xh, right? The flow, the Hamiltonian flow, the evolution under phase space. Or in other words, i.e. for all h, we have that the, the pullback of the flow of this 2n form is just itself. And proof. Here, define omega equals omega to the n over n, right? Where this is just 1 over n factorial of omega wedge dot 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 wedge omega. So why did I choose this? Well, let's tr Okay, so why did I choose this? Well, let's choose um, Darbo coordinates to see. So if this is not part of the proof, this is just some motivation. Or that is omega equals dq1 wedge dp1 plus dq2 wedge dp2. Let's just say we're on n equal 2, just to make life easy, okay? Let's try wedging these two together. What do we get? Well, we don't get 0 because, I mean, like, I... So what do we get? Well, let's look at the like terms that combine. So these ones give you zero because dq1 wedge dq1 equals zero no matter what, since it's anti-symmetric on one forms. Likewise, this equals zero. So then you're just left with the cross terms. So we have this one and this one. And what do they give? They give dq1, which dp1, which dq2, which dp2. Okay? In other words, standard volume form. Right? This is exactly the volume form that you'd expect, because this just says do a quadruple integral of 1 over a four-dimensional region like This just says do a quadruple integral over one of a four-dimensional region, right? And then there's two of these, so we get two times that, okay? So that is to say, that is to say in local coordinates, so in general, omega is dq1, which dp1, which dot dot dot, which dq and wedge dpn. That's what the n factorial is for, to make this equal to 1. Okay? So now here's the actual proof. Um, the pullback of omega to the n Okay, so now let's Okay, so now let's uh, give, give ourselves a little bit more space. And then we have the actual proof. 
So the pullback of the flow of omega is the pullback of omega to the n over n factorial. Now hopefully it shouldn't take too much convincing to see that the pullback of the... Now here's the actual proof. The pullback under the flow of omega is the pullback of omega to the n. And hopefully it shouldn't take too much convincing. The pullback under the flow of omega equals the pullback under the flow of omega to the n over n. Hopefully it shouldn't take too much convincing to see that the pullback go commutes with the the wedge product. So that's just the pullback of omega itself to the n. And finishing it off, there we go. Done. In other words, Louisville's theorem is an immediate consequence, essentially, of this fact that That the, that the symplectic form is preserved under Hamiltonian evolution. Basically, immediately gives you um, an invariant volume form. So now we can answer a question that's probably been plaguing you since the beginning of all of this symplectic geometry stuff. Why symplectic geometry? Well... Because, like, I mean, you know, you took physics one and you did Newtonian mechanics and you could solve all of these classical mechanics problems just fine. So what's the point of introducing all of this hard differential geometry framework and all of these complicated, hard to understand formulas? Um, why bother? What good does it do? And I think the answer is this. Well, not this particular, not exactly Louisville's theorem, but the stuff that Louisville theorem represents. Because Louisville's theorem, you can obviously show it in coordinates, right? Ultimately, you just um, take your expression for Hamilton's equations, take the divergence, you write it out, and then some mixed partials commute, and then you get your answer. But I don't think that's very illuminating as to saying, like, why symplectic geometry is true. But... This formulation, we have this fundamental fact of, you know, how these dynamics works, like this, this statement that's really core to Hamiltonian dynamics. And then as an immediate consequence, an almost triviality, we get that um, Louisville's theorem is true. So I think that this is an example where symplectic geometry really helps us see what's going on. It also generalizes to manifolds. Almost immediately, right? Because this whole decoordinated invariant language makes it work everywhere. So this is why we spent so long developing all of this.